Uh, so our next presenter is uh, Mayor John Mofeld. No, I was thinking the mayor. Is it okay to say Mayor John Mofeld? Um, it's it's a pleasure because I've actually gotten to work with John in different capacities with his because he's also with River Design Group. But to have him speaking here as representative of the city of Whitefish is uh, very nice and thank you. So. John is currently serving his fourth term as mayor of the city of Whitefish. In his capacity, he has worked <clears throat> to author and codify the city's water quality ordinance and lakeshore protection regulations. Well, when he's not serving as mayor, he is the principal and surface water, surface water hydrologist with River Design Group, a Montana-based consulting firm that provides water resource engineering services throughout the Intermountain West. John? Thanks for inviting me to speak uh, this morning in my capacity as mayor, although both professions kind of overlap with the presentation I'm about to present because my company did volunteer to help with creation of the water quality ordinance locally in Whitefish. Mayor is a volunteer position, so like the mayor service, we didn't get paid for the consulting service either, so kind of par for the course. Anyway. <laughs> I thought I'd start with just a little background on kind of what formed the foundation of our local area aquatic resources in Whitefish. As many of you know, we're situated in the northwest corner of the state in the Purcell Trench. And for thousands of years, we saw several advancements and retreats of glacial continental ice uh, through the Purcell Trench with the terminal moraine typically ending in the vicinity of Polson, just south of Flathead Lake. So. With that said, the glacial character of Whitefish is fairly um, complex. Along the eastern shoreline of Whitefish Lake, we tend to see very steep slopes that were plastered with lateral moraine, glacial till, compacted glacial, brittle till, whereas the west side of Whitefish Lake and then just beyond the recessional moraine, which is just on the south side of Whitefish Lake that ultimately impounded Whitefish Lake, we see significant deep deposits of lean, silty clay materials that just have generally very low permeability and don't drain very well, particularly uh, when we're dealing with snow on frozen ground conditions in the spring. And that really characterizes the bulk of the high groundwater areas that have been mapped in Whitefish that are also coincident with many of our wetland environments. And that's shown in uh, red on the left map, that's the mapped high groundwater area that again also is associated or are associated with those, you know, lean silty clay materials that bracket the southern half of our planning jurisdiction and certainly bracket the entire length of the Whitefish River that flows about eight miles through the city limits. Um, back in about 2008, we found it necessary to undergo a stormwater utility plan. So a part of that plan was mapping all critical stormwater conveyances, which is the map on the right uh, shown in yellow. And those conveyances generally represented all of our intermittent and ephemeral waterways in Whitefish that are tributary to our major streams that feed the Whitefish River as well as Whitefish Lake, including Viking Creek, Haskell Creek, Trumbull Creek, Swift Creek, uh, Eagle Creek, et cetera. So we recognize the value that these intermittent and ephemeral drainages provide to our city because they ultimately feed the receiving waters and protecting or evaluating protections for those first and second order tributaries we felt would be important from a water quality perspective. So as you know, Whitefish is a pretty uh, rapidly growing uh, city, which began basically when I moved there in 1995. But of course, the Flathead is also rapidly growing. I think it was one of the largest uh, growing counties in the state of Montana, if not nationally, uh, two years ago. Uh, what drives a lot of the development in Whitefish is our proximity, of course, to Glacier National Park. The fact that about 90% of the land base in Flathead County is either in federal, state, or private timberland ownership. Um, and also, of course, the amenities that we offer, Whitefish Lake, uh, the ski resort at Big Mountain. So it's a, obviously you've heard it in the news. It's a very popular um, area. And back in about the 2000s, when I first got on city council, we were starting to see significant development pressure throughout the city as the easily developable uh, lands were already developed. People started seeking opportunities to build on steep slopes, to fill 
non-protected wetlands to encroach on our rivers. And so that kind of alarmed the council at the time, myself in particular, and that's when we essentially initiated uh, the water quality plan that I'm gonna be presenting uh, this evening. And just a couple examples of some of the development pressures we are seeing along the Whitefish River. Uh, this was prior to our adoption of our stream setback ordinance, uh, the Pine Lodge and Whitefish adjacent to the Whitefish River. And I spoke to the geology briefly, but when you have these silty lean clays superimposed along the river margins of Whitefish River on steep slopes, they're very vulnerable to rotational slope failures, particularly when you load the slope with impervious surfaces and, of course, weight associated with asphalt driveways, retaining walls, you name it. So we observed over the years many instances where inadequate development standards resulted in significant rotational slope failures along the Whitefish River. And just looking at these barbed lacustrine sediments and how vulnerable they are to failure, particularly during spring snowmelt when those soils saturated and you have positive poor water pressure that kind of seeks out those gravel and fine sand layers and cause, cause this, causes the slope failure. Um, this was back in 1987, just on the north side of Central Avenue in Whitefish. This is kind of a view from Highway 93 of one of the rotational slope failures that took out the city's road plus an interceptor trench uh, related to BNSF cleanup efforts, as well as a sewer main. And then more recently, uh, downriver within our jurisdiction um, on the outside of the meander bend of the Whitefish River. In this case, uh, this development was constructed and immediately we started observing slope movement. Um, so these combined observations really is what drove the catalyst for Whitefish to start looking at our own water uh, quality protection ordinance. And this wasn't a very easy ordinance to develop, I'll admit that um, right now. It was politically charged. We were fraught with opponents to the law, including the uh, real estate development groups, uh, the building association, both national, or excuse me, both statewide, as well as the northeast or northwest portion of the state. So it took about two years. We hired a consultant. My firm helped, but I was largely working in the capacity as mayor, and we had a great interdisciplinary team that kind of brought their knowledge on all these different topics to the table. But it was a two-year process, and I'll leave on a funny note, but the day, the, the following week when this ordinance was to be adopted, and this is how politically charged these things can get in Montana, and I think nationally, they knew that I was getting reelected and that there, if a tie vote came down at the first meeting in January, I would break the tie and this ordinance would pass. So they tried to sue me based on my residency saying I had moved out of town. Well, the district court threw it out with prejudice the day I was sworn in to office and we were fortunate to be able to pass this ordinance. But that's how, that's how crazy this process got. So a lot of compromise back and forth to arrive at what we felt was a reasonable ordinance that provides for critical protections of our stormwater conveyances, our intermittent and ephemeral streams, uh, steep slope construction, and of course, all streams within our jurisdiction, including Whitefish Lake. We require a permit uh, compliance uh, that's submitted to the planning and building department with the building permit. It has to identify all the existing and proposed improvements, the location of all aquatic resources, slopes greater than 10%, and then location of all proposed improvements that will be sited within uh, 200 feet of our aquatic resources. As part of that plan, recognizing that, that we would probably have applications that would result in temporary wetland or permanent wetland impacts, we included a comp compensatory mitigation uh, requirement as well as bonding for any improvements or enhancements or creations met or made to offset wetland loss. So just a real brief uh, overview of the buffers and setbacks uh, that were um, codified under our ordinance. Uh, we had what we refer to as both buffers, which are basically no construction zones, as well as structural setbacks from those uh, buffers. And so along the Whitefish River, we adopted 75 feet or top of bank, whichever is greater, plus a 20 foot uh, construction setback from that top of bank or 75 foot uh, measurement. All other perennial streams within our jurisdiction, we adopted 100 uh, foot setbacks. 
uh, with a or excuse me buffers with a 10 foot setback and we allowed for some variation in that setback depending on what type of land use was proposed and how intense that would be in terms of impacting water quality so obviously some averaging there um, intermittent streams a 50 foot buffer um, all intermittent and ephemeral streams a 20 foot uh, buffer as well as a 10 foot structural setback and then of course based on montana code annotated Whitefish Lake, we still have a 20 foot lakeshore protection zone from ordinary high water. Plus we adopted an additional 10 foot uh, structural uh, setback as part of our local area regulations. And a lot of the reason we're able to adopt these city specific ordinances is because we're a charter city and we have self governing powers through our charter that allows us to adopt regulations as long as they're not restricted by state law. So this is an example of how these setbacks are essentially applied. This photo demonstrates the 75 foot buffer along the riparian zone. And then in this case, it would be actually the top of bank plus the 20 foot um, setback, whichever is greater is how it's written. And in terms of wetland protections, and I'm not a wetland scientist, although I work with a lot of wetland scientists like Tom Parker, um, but we applied all of our wetland protections and setbacks to not only jurisdictional wetlands, but also isolated wetlands. You know, in the Whitefish area, we have so many uh, pothole wetlands that don't have a direct surface water connection, either an inlet or an outlet. And we felt that those were equally important uh, to protect um, as part of our general policy. So we applied these regulations to category one and category two um, wetlands. We also have fairly unique wetland um, community types in our town, the forested uh, community with Engelman spruce and skunk cabbage, for example. Um, so we worked with DEQ and actually several consultants on kind of crafting this language to make it a bit more specific to our planning. Area. Uh, for wetland protections, we've adopted 100 foot setbacks for single family residences. 125 feet for multifamily, industrial, and commercial uh, developments, but we also allow some buffer averaging. Up to 50% of the buffer could be reduced as long as it's expanded into another location. And so that at the end of the day, the net functions are maintained and the net area is equivalent to as if they didn't require the, or need the buffer averaging. This is an example of how these buffers can be applied. And these are, this is an example where we had a non-jurisdictional uh, wetland, an isolated wetland um, on a residential development in town, the green area being the open space and wetlands uh, that were set aside uh, for protection. We allowed some um, buffer averaging in this instance, which was mitigated in the southeast corner, southwest corner of the development. We do allow, of course, um, low impact uses within these setbacks, you know, such as at, at grade trails um, et cetera, temporary structures. And you can just see some of the, the, the effect of how these local ordinances have been working to protect even isolated uh, wetlands that reflecting the 125 foot um, total setback plus buffer on that residential uh, development in town. So I'm not a compensatory mitigation expert by all, so I'll probably blow through this pretty quickly, but we did look at various wetland types from to high value wetlands, to non-exempt wetlands, to exempt wetlands, and whether we were being requested for creation or reestablishment, rehabilitation or enhancement, we developed uh, various you know, mitigation ratios. And those have been pretty well accepted and adhered to with the few applications we have had that have requested um, either the filling or partial uh, filling of uh, wetlands within our, our community. And again, I mentioned earlier that we require bonding up to five years and in, in a performance monitoring program to ensure that the overall functions and values are being met at the end of that five year period. Whether that five year period is enough or not is kind of up in the air. So moving on to lakeshore regulations, I really appreciated your where is it? Your the your your presentation before me about your lakeshore regulations and the Shoreline Protection Act. So again, our regulations follow Montana code annotated. I believe uh, state lakeshore regulations were crafted and adopted by the Montana state legislature back in the 1980s. 
So it includes a 20 foot lakeshore protection zone. What's unique about Whitefish is we annexed up to low water the entirety of Whitefish Lake and only a portion of our jurisdiction encompasses Whitefish Lake and the proper. And so the county administers everything from low water to high water plus the 20 foot setback. So in Whitefish, we've gone a little bit further uh, recognizing uh, some of the impacts we've seen around uh, the lake shore. Our regulations at one point prioritized and emphasized the use of quote 18 inch angular nominal riprap for the preferred shoreline stabilization technique. It also allowed for some retaining wall development if uh, danger to a, a home or a development was imminent. This is a good example of that on Skiles Place, an old retaining wall, you know, that home literally right on the 20 foot, um, ordinary, right 20 feet from the ordinary high water mark on the margin of the lakeshore protection zone. Um, we've adopted within our code dynamic equilibrium beaches as an alternative to riprap. And we've implored the help of Mark Larang, who used to be at the University of Montana Biostation. He helped us kind of codify this into our own lakeshore regulations uh, to try to um, basically recreate natural shoreline beach dynamics in lieu of hardening shorelines with riprap. And it's just a general concept of, and I know many of you are familiar with this, just trying to, to move that wave break further off the shoreline to provide a longer schwa zone to reduce you know, erosion along the shoreline. So we've um, implemented about four or five of these projects around Whitefish Lake. And this is an example of that same property um, I showed previously uh, with the expanded uh, beach swash zone. Um, and then of course, um, providing additional buffer for the landowner uh, for shoreline uh, protection. It just consists of basically a very well graded mix of gravels all the way up to coarse cobble, you know, based on the fetch length of the lake and the energy dynamics, et cetera. Shifting gears, one of the other tools we've used to protect local area water quality and wetlands is aggressively seeking opportunities for landscape level conservation easements. And the one I'm gonna to talk to you about today was related to our acquisition of a 3000 acre conservation easement right on the foothills of Whitefish, right below Big Mountain and down to basically the foothills of city limits. And it was 3,000 acres of land that was formerly and still is owned by Stoltz Land and Lumber Company. But over multiple years, they had sold off over 1,200 to 1,500 acres of forested working lands to Big Mountain or Winter Sports Incorporated. And those lands were slowly being converted from timberlands, working forests into commercial condos, you know, ski runs, et cetera. And coincidentally, Whitefish derives about 90% of its surface water uh, from the lands that drained the Haskell uh, conservation easement area. So we saw it as a pretty imminent threat to our water supply in Whitefish. And the reason it's so important to protect the surface water supply in Haskell is because it's much cheaper to treat compared to when our peak tourism season kicks in and the demand on water increases and flows in Haskell Basin are ramping down because they're second order streams, small drainage areas, we pump from Whitefish Lake. And it's a much more costly, not only to pump, but also to treat that water because it just has more stuff in it. So we, we aggressively pursued this um, conservation easement with Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Forest Service, working in partnership with of course Stoltz and the Trust for Public Land that really took the lead on this project. Um, we saw this kind of from a global perspective, which you're seeing nationally, these, these threats to wildfire and an opportunity to protect our urban wildfire interface while also safeguarding our municipal water supply for the city of Whitefish. So given the rapid growth in Whitefish, the off sale of these lands and conversion from historic timberlands to pervious surfaces, condos, et cetera, uh, we jumped on this opportunity. Um, we didn't have legal access to the water. So for over a hundred years, we merely um, operated, maintained and delivered water from those lands with a little more than a handshake with Stoltz Land and Lumber Company. Um, and they graciously approached the city about this potential 
um, acquisition, and we looked at it much differently for our from our water distribution system, where you typically think of traditional. You know, you have the pipes, you have the treatment plant, you have the distribution lines, but we viewed this as an opportunity to consider or think about that forested landscape as part of our municipal water supply infrastructure in the city. And that kind of leveraged us really well for several grants through those agencies that I, I mentioned. So long and short of it, we received funding from federal government sources, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Stoltz discounted the cost of the easement. And then we went to the voters in 2016 for an increase to our local option sales tax or our resort tax. And we increased the tax, the voters did, from 2% to 3% and we bonded that $8 million in revenue over 10 years through some of the legislative changes that uh, Governor Bullock actually passed um, that helped us kind of close this, this historic deal in Whitefish. So I just bring this up as another opportunity and something to throw out to the crowd that, you know, really looking at these landscape level conservation opportunities for our communities, I think is equally important to any policy or ordinance you, you can adopt and implement and enforce. Uh, currently today for that easement, we entered into a multi-resource management plan with the landowner. So we just purchased the development rights, which took the opportunity for those lands to be converted to development off the table. They still own the land, they still manage it, they still log it sustainably. And every year we meet to review if there's any resource conflicts with recreation, if adequate buffers are being maintained through forestry best management practices, et cetera. And it's kind of this adaptive management plan that we've entered into with uh, FWP as well as Stoltz. Um, one of the benefits of this project is we did adopt locally a climate action plan, which sets the target of reducing city owned facility greenhouse emissions to 0% by 2040. It's a pretty ambitious goal that we're hoping to accomplish over 25 years. But part of what we're able to leverage with this project, because this is a facility of the city, was the, the credits for carbon sequestration with this project. So we're using this project in addition to help, you know, meet, meet our goal of carbon neutrality for city owned facilities uh, by 2040. And then talking about wetland protection streams, outdoor recreation, I think we all understand the importance that intact landscapes provide to our local economy. And in Whitefish, as in other communities throughout the state, it's a significant draw for out-of-state tourists as well as people that are moving to Whitefish to live, start businesses, and raise families. And in Whitefish, it translates to hundreds of millions of dollars in direct uh, spending in our towns and our shops that are primarily locally owned, plus a significant increase in our, our, our labor force in town. So I think by protecting our aquatic resources, doing what we can at the local level, whether it's an easement or ordinances or lakeshore protection regulations, by preserving that sense of place and keeping our ecosystems as intact as possible, acknowledging the development pressures we're seeing, I think it's going to bode very well for whitefish and I know Montana for that matter. So that's all I had and just some acknowledgments. So thanks very much. So we have uh, five minutes for questions. Claire? I'm, excuse me. I'm curious about those ratios, um, the really high ratios on enhancement. Um, and, and, and just in general, I guess uh, you said this you've had a few permits for come through that have required mitigation and how have folks responded to this and has that been pretty good for the kind of restoration you want i'm just curious i've only seen a few instances where these have actually been applied and they've all been in the creation or reestablishment category we haven't seen any applications come in regarding fens for example um so i when i was reviewing this slide last week with a fellow colleague who is a wetland specialist she made the same point that those rehab and enhancement ratios actually do look really high and 
if this group has any recommendations that I can bring back to the city, um, by all means, you know, shoot, because we're certainly open to, you know, looking at these in more detail. Yeah, I, I think they're great. <laughs> and, and is, is reestablishment, is that, I, I guess, what a lot of these maybe older types of matrices think of as restoration? Correct. The same definition. Okay. Like partial fills and then expanding in a different location or congruent to the existing wetland complex. So, makes sense. Thanks, Blair. I will say, assuming that the, for example, rehabilitation of a fan at re rehabbing six acres of fan for every one acre of impact, I actually like the high mitigation ratios. And I know those aren't the same um, that the core does. And I'm sure if you are the one impacting those, you would not be as happy. But to me, I actually really like it. It, um, it sets a pretty high standard. It's a deterrent for sure. Hi, Emerald Grant, Blackfeet Environmental Office. Um, one of the questions that I have beyond Montana state laws and regulations has Whitefish itself amped up its uh, regulations and fines for invasive aquatic species? About That's a great question. As you may recall, I think about 10 years ago, we actually partnered with the Blackfeet Reservation on providing funding for the Browning Check Station. So that was about 10 years ago in, in an effort to kind of close off those major entry points that weren't being covered by the current state program. Uh, now we've adopted our own AIS program that's funded by a lot of philanthropy through the Whitefish Lake Institute in partnership with the city. So we man or, excuse me, we staff an AIS check station both at Whitefish City Beach, which is a city park, as well as in partnership with FWP at State Park. So yes, we do. Yep. Thanks for the question. I'm really excited about that uh, area that you conserved for your watershed or for your water intake. Um, I'm just curious about the agreement that you have uh, with the lumber company and what sort of protections that you put in for recourse if they're not doing what you'd like them to do. Um, maybe, maybe you could just elaborate a little bit more on that agreement. Yeah, yeah, sure. So Stoltz retains ownership of those lands, as you mentioned. Uh, we put into place a multi-resource management plan that sets expectations for how um, sustainable forestry can continue on those lands. Um, they're one of the largest private timber producers in Montana, just for the as an FYI. But every year we have an, a liaison team that meets. Um, it consists of Stoltz, F, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, in the city of Whitefish, and we basically review that multi-resource management plan and literally sit down and talk about conflicts, what can be done better, what isn't being done. Um, one of the big issues now is um, recreation, you know, because they allowed for permanent public recreation to these lands, which has historically been the case. But now we're seeing a lot of unmanaged, non-planned, single-track mountain bike trails being developed that are really causing issues for the landowner. And so that's just an example of some of the issues we address, you know, annually. 